This is the first video in what I hope is a long series of testing DualSense replacement batteries. There does seem to be quite a selection of batteries to choose from these days. So this video is an introduction to the series. And it is not really about a replacement battery. The battery I am looking at in this video is what I will call the reference battery. It is a Sony OEM battery out of a brand new DualSense controller. It's the most expensive small battery I've ever bought as the only way I was sure I could get the correct battery was to buy a new DualSense controller. I do have a video about the testing I did to determine how the DualSense charges and discharges its battery. If you are interested in that there will be a link to that video in the description. The model number on this battery is SNYHR37. The battery size is 60.5 mm in length, 40 mm high and 8.3 mm deep. The weight of this battery is 31.6 grams. I know the weight doesn't tell much as that is the weight of the entire battery, the plastic shell, wires and connector. I haven't taken this battery apart yet as I still have need for it in testing. So the weight of the lithium ion cell itself will be missing. If I can remember I'll add a note to the description sometime in the future. The values I get from this battery will be used as the reference point that I will compare other batteries against. This battery will be the baseline. I wanted to replicate the battery conditions of a DualSense controller as best I could but charging was a challenge. The DualSense has a very strange charge profile. It starts at 500 milliamps and steps down in 100 milliamp increments. The problem I ran into was I couldn't find a fixed pattern as to the 100 milliamp step rate. It's almost like the controller will not charge the battery the same way every time. And that I can't have for my testing. I want every battery charged the same way. So I'm using a standard charge profile of a constant current and then once a cutoff voltage is reached, I switch to a constant voltage until the cutoff current is reached. And then the charge cycle is ended. Now the higher the cutoff voltage and to some extent the lower the cutoff current, the greater the charge state of the battery. In my testing the lowest battery voltage I saw at charge cutoff was 4.163 volts and the lowest current I saw at cutoff was 55 milliamps. Average over three controllers was close to 4.17 volts and 59 milliamps. So I have chosen 4.160 volts and 60 milliamps as the cutoff values. I think that will give me a battery state of charge just a little lower than you will get with most DualSense controllers. But it should be very close. At least it will be consistent from one battery test to the next. And that is really what I'm after, a comparison of one battery to another. The discharge cutoff voltage was easier to obtain. I simply took a one second average of the voltage when the controllers cut off. I think it was like 8 runs over 2 different controllers. And that worked out to be 3.39 volts. And that seemed quite reasonable to me. If you want a nice long cycle life you would not want to discharge the battery below 3.3 volts. I have 3 load profiles. There is a constant 500 milliwatt load. This is very close to an older DualSense with rumble turned off. If I remember correctly with rumble off it was like a 460 milliwatt average. So this reading will give about the maximum runtime for an older DualSense controller. I have a I'll say mid to light rumble load. I took an hour of data of my playing Borderlands 3 and used that as the basis for the load profile. So you can imagine how much that could vary. I think this will give a pretty good average of battery runtime. And then I have a 1 watt load. I don't think in my testing I ever saw a sustained load of 1 watt. Very short peaks of over 2 watts, maybe a 1 or 1 1.2 watt load for a second or so. But I believe this load will give a worst case runtime for the battery. I think a game would have to be trying to shake the controller out of your hands to pull this much power continuously. And here are the results. Well a set of results. Out of multiple runs these are the lowest values I recorded. At a 500 milliwatt load the battery delivered 5.74 watt hours. And the load ran for 11 hours and 36 minutes. In the light rumble load setting the battery delivered 5.68 watt hours. And the load ran for 9 hours and 50 minutes. 
at a 1 watt load, the battery delivered 5.46 watt hours, and the load ran for 5 hours and 30 minutes. Those of you that are used to calculating power numbers might notice something a little off, especially in the 1 watt load graph. 1 watt pulled for 5.5 hours should be 5.5 watt hours, so I'm 40 milliwatt hours short. Here is the load in progress, and the actual load is about 998 milliwatts but that only accounts for about 10 milliwatt hours of the era. The processor I'm using only has single precision floating point hardware, so each power calculation loses a tiny bit, and at 1000 calculations per second, it adds up. But it doesn't add up enough to make me go in and redo the program to fixed point math. The few tens of milliwatts is not going to affect the end result of the test. The rumble load minimum value I recorded was 5.681 watt hours, and the maximum I recorded was 5.795 watt hours. You might say why the difference if they were charged the same both times. It's temperature mainly, especially the temperature of the battery when being charged. That 114 milliwatt hour difference may look a bit much, but it's really only about 2%. And a 4 degrees C difference in battery temperature when they were charged could easily shift the capacity that much. So the averages over multiple charges and discharges look like this. And right now I'm leaning on using these values for the baseline reference. Leave a comment on what value you think I should use. The maximum, minimum, or the average value. I'm still undecided. The point is, a couple of hundred milliwatt hours difference between batteries is not going to be noticeable in use. There are just too many other variables in play. And I really am going to try and keep that in mind when testing the replacement batteries. I don't have the teardown of the reference battery yet, but I am going to include the teardown of an older Sony OEM battery that came in a DualSense controller. A model LIP1708 from a controller with a BDM-020 mainboard. I do believe this is the same model battery that came in the initial version of the DualSense controller. The specs on the batteries look the same for both, but they are different batteries. The weight of the older battery is 33.7 grams, whereas the weight of the newer battery is 31.6 grams. Of course, that is the weight with the plastic shell, as the lithium-ion cell itself is a pouch inside the plastic. Both of these batteries are listed at 1560 milliamp hours at 3.65 volts. So that would give a watt hours of 5.694, which is why the battery is listed as a 5.7 watt hour battery. If anyone has seen a different model battery in their dual sense, please leave a comment. The lithium ion cell itself looks like this. Now it might seem strange to have the Murata brand on the cell. I don't remember how long ago it was, but Murata bought Sony's battery manufacturing. Obviously, it was before this controller was manufactured. Cell weight will be one of my comparison points between batteries, and this cell weighs 27.6 grams. As for the age of this battery, I would say the controller this came out of was bought between three and four years ago, probably closer to four, and this cell is worn slap out. Inside the battery is the lithium ion cell and a bit of battery protection circuitry. The cell tabs are spot welded to the circuit board, which I like. The battery protection board looks like this. The Y and R resistors are too low a value for me to measure, as would be expected as they are in line with the power delivery. The two small resistors go to terminals on the battery protection IC, and this is the cell protection IC. The numbers on the top line are 441E70R1, and the numbers on the bottom line are 1801M821. A quick search didn't find anything on the IC, but the IC is hooked up just like a Mitsumi MD1421 series one cell lithium ion battery protection IC. The circuit looks something like this. I would note here that the 10K ohm thermosistor is not connected to the cell protection IC. So what to do with the battery if it's too hot or too cold is up to the battery charge circuit in the DualSense controller. I would say a nicely made battery. It would be nice to know the actual part number for the protecting IC. Anyone have any other ideas what the part number might be, please leave a comment. The Sony SNY HR37 battery is very accurately labeled. 
5.7 watt hours is the minimum I would expect out of it in a DualSense controller. The case in point, this battery, charged by a DualSense controller in an ambient temperature of a little over 80 degrees Fahrenheit, charge cutoff voltage was 4.165 volts, the load was about 350 milliwatts, and this battery delivered over 6 watt hours of power. So slight changes to cutoff voltage and charge and discharge battery temperature can make noticeable differences in the power numbers. But even with these differences, I'm still only looking at a little over a 5% change in power delivery. I'll see if other manufacturers can be as accurate with their power numbers. The replacement battery reviews should be shorter videos. I won't be going over the cutoff values for the charge and discharge or any of that information. It will just be power testing, the teardown of the battery, and the testing of the battery protection circuit. The battery I'm currently testing is a VG-P5366 from Amazon. It claims 8,880 milliwatt hours, so I will find out. So watch for the next episode to see how the claimed 8.8 watt hour battery did. See if it is a usable replacement battery for the DualSense controller. And if you don't mind, subscribe and give a thumbs up. Thank you for watching.